Hello, welcome to the bird watching channel and this program on ruby throated hummingbirds, part one of a four part series. This section on basic characteristics of ruby throated hummingbirds. I'm your host and fellow bird watcher, Sharon Sorensen. You know, hummingbirds are just incredible little creatures. There are about 330 of them in the world and all of them in the Western Hemisphere and almost all of them within 10 degrees north or south of the equator. About 20 roam north of Mexico, but not very far north of Mexico. And so here in the Midwest, we have one. Oh yeah, occasionally we get some rarities, but basically we have the ruby-throated hummingbird. Hummingbirds in general are pretty awesome critters and ruby throats are among the most amazing. They only weigh a tenth of an ounce, that's about the size of a dime. They can fly in any direction, left, right, up, down, front, back, even upside down for short times. They can hover for incredible lengths of time and go from zero to 60 in just an instant and in spite of all that, they cannot walk. So if they land on a branch and they need to move over left or right, they lift up, fly over, sit back down. But these birds are amazingly intelligent and have incredible memories. They can remember where your feeders were last year. And they've been to Costa Rica and back in the meantime. And they're really curious, nosy little critters. They'll come and investigate you if you're sitting outside quietly, especially if you're wearing glasses. They're attracted by the motion, the reflections in your glasses, and they'll come and check you out. But in spite of how cute and sweet and charming they are, they are flamboyant warriors. I was working with a hummingbird bander one time who said, you know what, if they were big enough, they would eat you. Well, having said that, let's talk about how to tell the difference between males and females of mature, that is, breeding ruby-throated hummingbirds. Males are noted, and it's their namesake characteristic, for their ruby throats. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, that one doesn't look so very ruby to me, but we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But that's certainly distinguished between the male and the female with her all-white throat. So that's a fairly easy ID if you can see them from the front. Males, however, as I said, that gorget can be namesake ruby red or it can actually be almost black. These two photographs are of the same bird perched on the same branch in the same position except that he's throwing his head left to right, looking around, allowing the sunlight to catch his gorget. It cause, the sunlight causes the gorget to flash, and that's how he attracts the females. The females can also be identified by the white dots at the ends of their tails. And in addition to that, if they are breeding birds, by the nest band across their breast. And that nest band is there because the elastic type top on their nest fits very snugly. More on that later. So that tail feather identification is readily visible in some birds, especially if they're showing aggression. But tail feather identification in the male comes in the form of its shape, not its color. And males have a forked tail. That fork tail isn't always visible when they're perched, but you'll be able to recognize it from its gorget in that case. Sometimes late in the season, you're going to see a bird with a combination of white spots and a fork tail. And if white spots are supposed to represent a female and a fork tail is supposed to represent a male, what's a person to think? Well, this is a fledgling. And when the fledglings come out of the nest, they look like mom. So, fork tail shape in place, but the white dots still are representing a fledgling. And at this time also, this bird is just starting to show the development of a gorget. In fact, late in the season, sometimes you see a single ruby on that ruby-throated male, and sometimes you'll start seeing multiple ruby dots. 
Beware, however, that the light can fool you. I've had people say, oh my gosh, I have a yellow hummingbird. I have a brown hummingbird. I have a green hummingbird. I have a black hummingbird. I have a rarity in my yard. And the light can really fool you. This is a, a simply a ruby-throated hummingbird in late afternoon light. And it looks pure gold. So let's talk just quickly about the diet. I know what you're thinking. Oh gosh, everybody knows what a hummingbird eats. They eat nectar. They come to, to the nectar and syrup feeders. And indeed, 40% of their diet is nectar. That leaves 60% of something else, and that's small flying insects. They need all those insects for protein. You know, no, nobody can live on sugar water. And so birds have to have that protein as much as we do. Their metabolism is incredibly high. Their wings beat 70 to 200 times a second, depending on what they're doing, whether they're hovering, whether they're in a ferocious fight with another male, uh, or whether they're cruising uh, in migration. 250 breaths a minute, 1,000 heartbeats a minute. That's really high. And their body temperature runs between 104 and 108 degrees. So given that, given that incredibly high metabolism, they have to eat a lot, about every 20 minutes. If a 150-pound human had to keep up with them, they would have to eat 80 meals of 1,000 calories every day. Isn't that awesome? You know, you'd even get sick of banana splits at that point. So yes, they have to eat every 20 minutes. Do you sense a problem? What do they do at night? They can't eat at night. And so what they do is go into a state of torpor. Think of it as overnight hibernation. And when that happens, their heart rate drops to a few beats a minute. The body temperature falls maybe to 70. And to keep from falling off a perch and dying, they perch rigidly. Their feet become locked. In fact, sometimes you'll find them locked upside down. And you'll wonder how in the world they can be hanging there upside down. Their breathing may stop for minutes, and they're very trance-like and they're cold to the touch, and they look dead. I mean, the bottom line is they look dead, except that, for the most part, they're upright. Come morning, it takes about a half hour for them to resume full behavior. These birds winter in Central America, mostly Costa Rica, and so they arrive in the U.S., along the Gulf Coast in last week of February, usually. And so by the time they regain their energy from that long flight and reach the Midwest, it's early April, and the males arrive first. The females arrive a few weeks later, and on their own, they establish their territories and begin their nests. And they are incredibly tiny nests. If you put a quarter over the nest, it would cover it up. Here's a pencil eraser on the edge of a nest with two tiny babies. So these females are amazing creatures and give a whole new definition to single mom. They build their nest alone. She incubates her eggs alone. She feeds all of her nestlings alone. She fledges her babies alone. Those babies are adult size when they fledge, but they still have to be fed for a few brief days, and she does that alone. And meanwhile, she's building a new nest for a second brood. Wow. After the male breeds the second time, he has nothing left to do, so... He goes back to Costa Rica. He just, oh, he's had a rough season. He's going to go back to the Caribbean. So he leaves by doubling his weight and gorging on insects and preparing to fly that 18 to 24 hours nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico. And that leaves the female here to finish her second brood. And as soon as she gets that second brood out, she leaves. That means that all of those birds that you see ganging at your feeders in late August and the first two weeks of September are almost entirely the youngsters. The youngsters from the first broods, the youngsters from the second broods. 
the youngsters that have migrated south from, say, even southern rim of Canada, and maybe a few of those adults that are migrating late from late broods in Canada. But basically, you've got all the youngsters there. So this is just an incredible group of birds with an incredible array of secrets to share with us. Thank you for joining me with their, about their basic characteristics, and I hope you'll join me for part two, which is migration and nesting. That will be followed by part three, which deals with threats and predation, and part four, which addresses how to attract hummingbirds to your yard. I hope you've enjoyed this program, and I hope you have many birds to enjoy, and may you always have birds in your binoculars. <laughs>